Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or gathering with us virtually on Facebook Live, either this morning or during the week, we are a community of God's welcome and hospitality. So no matter what brings you to this service, whatever you believe, or however you understand this space, know that you are welcome here and we believe God loves you. A few things about our service today. Later in the service, we will share prayers from this community. If you have a prayer you would like to share, Please do that on Facebook Live, or there are green cards located near the entrance. Simply write those prayers down and share them with the church leadership, and we will incorporate those into our prayer life. Also, if you're on Facebook Live, let us know where you're joining us from. It reminds us that we remain connected in this time of a new way of being church. Also, Nellie is gathering with the children for children's ministry in a hybrid format in the children's ministry room. Misan is gathering with our youth up in the youth room. If you're interested in receiving any information about those programs, please reach out to us after the service. Also, we will be breaking bread later in the service. Um, know that if you're joining us virtually, any communion elements are welcome in that space. So grab those communion elements that are meaningful to you. And for those that are here, we still have those wonderful all-in-one communion cups that we'll use later in the service. And those are near the entryway. So make sure you grab those. Uh, also, there is a, a table up here with candles. If you feel called to light a candle for peace, for hope, or for joy in the world, there will be opportunities to do that during the service and after the service. Finally, we return to the reminder that we are a community of God's welcome and God's grace. So no matter how you join us, whatever brings you to this service, know that you are welcome here today. In the spirit of that, I invite you, as you are able, to please stand and join together in song. Forget 
Please be seated. And now we've come to that time in the service in which we share prayers, prayers from within our own community and even beyond. In a few moments, I will share the prayers that have been mentioned in this community. And again, I encourage, if you have prayers you'd like to share, please do that on Facebook Live. And if you're not comfortable in that space, there are green cards located at the entrance. You can utilize those and give those to one of the leaders of worship, and we'll make sure to include those prayers in our prayer life. I will share a prayer from this community, and I will then say, Maybe that's God saying, move it along. <laughs> anyway, I will share a prayer from this community and then say the phrase, God, in your mercy. Uh, and then I invite you to respond with the phrase, hear our prayers. We begin by giving thanks this day for Mother's Day, uh, for all those who have intentionally made that choice and embraced that model. But this is also a day that Mother's Day can be a painful day, a day that produces shame, uncertainty for a myriad of reasons. So we step into day with tension, both celebrating and grieving, both standing with and crying with those who find this day difficult. So no, those who enter this space, all of those emotions are welcome and embraced. So this day, let us give thanks to God for all the ways we express family and stand with one another. God, in your mercy. We also pray this day for this community of faith that continues to be a space of welcome and hospitality, to be reminded of God's love in a number of ways. So let us give thanks for First Christian Church of Burbank. God, in your mercy. We also give thanks for our partners in ministry, that which are many, but especially include Burbank Temporary Aid Center, Project Mercy, Family Promise, Homemade Thursdays, Green Chalice, and so many others. God, in your mercy. We also continue to pray for the following individuals who are facing some kind of medical uncertainty. For Janine, Pam J, Carlos, Stan, Brian and Nancy, Amy, Ken, Gina and Forrest, Lisa Poole's father, and Britt today also requests prayers for her friends, Elizabeth and Ian. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We pray for those in assisted living facilities and those who seek to care for them, such as Janet, Paul, Audrey, and Lisa. God, in your mercy. Also, as sweeps continue across L.A. County, we pray for the unhoused and those experiencing homelessness, those who stand with them and seek to create a sustainable and just system. God, in your mercy. We also pray for creation and all of nature. As wildfires sweep across northern New Mexico, we pray for a creation that groans under the weight of climate change. God, in your mercy. This day, as we gather, we are well aware of the headlines that have happened this past week as related to Roe versus Wade. We pray for those individuals and communities that feel at loss for words, that seek solace. And while faith communities have been a harmful presence in that conversation, know that this space is a space in which we can bring multiple conversations to play. We can be a place of safety, of love, discernment, and patience and we can stand with those who are most vulnerable. So we offer our prayers. God, in your mercy. Finally, again, we turn to this whole world, indeed, all of creation, that we as a community individu individuals might strive to embody love, discover hope, and create peace that movement might move beyond this space and multiple spaces, indeed, into this whole world. God, in your mercy, let us continue this spirit of prayer and worship in song. There 
there's a house It's not on a hill And the paint's chipping off Of the old windowsill There's a tree in the front yard That's older than me And older than all of you There's a smell that the heat makes It reminds me of Christmas And birthdays in December I remember her I remember her I remember her so well She would kiss my hand She would kiss my head Then she'd fall asleep with me In my tiny bed She'd sing me lullabies Gave me my hazel eyes And then she'd call me beautiful She made me beautiful I As I try to save them, they turn to gray. Just like the house, it's not on a hill with all the rust on the gate, the chips on the sill. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. God of love, God of gentle spirit, as we come to this time of worship, we come from different families, different understandings, and different realities. Yet in a way miraculous and mythical, you welcome us into this space and embrace us regardless of where we are or how we land. And on this day in which we give thanks for mothers and mother-like figures, we ask that you hold a space, a space for those who grieve and find this day complicated and difficult. And God, we know that you are large and broad enough to hold all of that, and for that we give thanks. And in those prayers this day, we also know you've heard the prayers we've named. For family and friends, for circumstances and realities, for things we don't quite know what to say about. We ask that you wrap those prayers in that same gentle love, creating for us ways to see beauty, ways to discover hope, and yes, ways to embrace peace. And then finally, God, we return to ourselves, not in a selfish way, but a way that asks you to empower us, enliven us to be that same spirit of gentle and kind and just love in this world. We ask this all in your sacred name. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes from John 20, 19 through 30. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house were where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father was sent, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, I put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. God of ancient story and even of doubt, open to us this day, this story, your presence and your call. In your name we pray, amen. Doubting Thomas. For those who've attended church for a while, this is probably a well-known story and he gets an awfully bad rap. But let me tell you what this story is not about. This story is not about demonizing people who question the church. This is not a story about those who seriously wrestle with beliefs, figuring out who God is and how that works out in community. This story is not meant to minimize the very real struggles people have with religious communities and how they work in the world. For we know from the disciples and Jesus' own narrative that they were experts at questioning religious and governmental institutions, that they themselves faithfully wrestled with how to live an ethical life and how to understand God. No, this story is not about wrestling with faith, questioning the church, or even questioning your pastor. This is a community of faith that encourages you to do just that. If you ever have a question about what I say, what we believe, or what we do, say something about it. Rigorously question me and one another. So this story is not about demonizing that particular practice. But rather, this story has multiple other meanings. And I believe one of those meanings is to listen and to trust the stories that enter our lives and our space. Let me say that again. One of the meanings of this particular story is to trust and to listen to the very real stories that enter our community. You might be asking, what do you mean by that? And so I invite you for a minute to step into the imagination and begin to read between the lines of what has already occurred in this story. And that's two profound experiences of what we call the post-resurrection Jesus. There was that story of Mary who encountered the mysterious and metaphorical Jesus in the garden. Do you remember that story from Easter Sunday? It was Mary who encountered that. But she was immediately not believed and questioned. One, because of her social location as being a woman. Two, What she was talking about was just so profound that this story and message of love 
and hope born in the world continued. But that's not where the story stops. Then the disciples at the beginning of the story are gathered in the upper room. And they too have a profound experience that this Jesus they thought, not just Jesus, but the message itself of love, of justice and of hope had somehow died. They had such a profound experience that they believed that message lived on. So you have these two experiences, that that profound message of Jesus' life was not able to be put in the grave by the Roman Empire, but in some mysterious and profound way had lived on. And these disciples were being equipped to embody and carry that message on but somebody wasn't in the room for it. Somebody wasn't there, and it was Thomas. And so I imagine what began to happen was that community of people said to Thomas, listen, listen to us, listen, it's still alive. The message continues, it persists. That notion that God loves us and calls us to do the same, the notion that calls us to be about a loving and just presence in the world is not dead but lives. Listen to what we've seen and heard. Listen. And as theologian and preacher Nancy Pittman says, what became doubting Thomas's downfall is that he had community shattering doubt. It wasn't that he questioned the institution, but he questioned the very lived and real experiences of Mary and those disciples. The pain, loss, redemption, and joy that they brought to him, he doubted it. It wasn't that he doubted belief, he doubted friends, colleagues, those he'd struggled with, those he'd cried with, those he'd laughed with, those he'd built community with. He didn't trust their very lived and real experience of pain and hope, of suffering, of joy, of loss, and now redemption. And that, I believe, is one of the messages of this story, is that if we're going to step into doubting Thomas's space and critique him, which be careful, because we all fall into this category, is that he questioned the experiences of those he encountered. And that as a community of faith, there are those that enter our lives and our spaces on a regular basis with stories, profound stories, stories of loss, stories of suffering and of grief, stories of joy and redemption, I'm just going to let it pass. It's good to be in a neighborhood because we can interact with that neighborhood in a whole lot of ways. And we're called to do that, even the honking horns. Stories of redemption, stories of hope and of joy reborn, stories that enter our space. And what a doubting Thomas would do would be, there's no way. That's not possible. I have to experience it myself. It's not as bad as you say it is. There's no way you experienced it. It doesn't get that bad. Doubting Thomas, in a way, is a one who says, for me to feel or understand your pain, I must experience it as well. Doubting Thomas is a one who, in order to understand your joy and your redemption, has to experience it as well. And so one of the meanings beneath this story is to trust that storytelling space. That as a community of faith, those who enter our space virtually or through our doors, we must trust and are called to trust their experience. And experience is. When they say, listen to me, we listen. When they say, let me tell you about my pain, we sit with it. When they say, let me tell you the ways in which I've experienced a redeemed and loving God, listen to it. There are those that enter our space with the profound pain and history of the church. 
It is not our job to say it couldn't have been that bad. It is our call to say, let me hear it. Let me sit with it. There are those that enter our space with a complicated history of family. Love and what that means. Our job isn't to say, oh, no, it's not that bad. Just be joyful. Just give thanks. It'll be okay. No, our call is to step into the space of listening, of hearing, and even believing what that story is. When I was a teenager, my friends and I had a regular practice, especially in middle school, junior high, of debating social issues of the day. We, were thought, we thought we were the smartest people out there. We had it all figured out. Every issue you think you could imagine, we had it ticked off the list. And God help my parents, because we approached them with that attitude. But there was one day we were sitting in my grandmother's front yard going over all of these issues. And she had fixed us something, some snacks or something that day, and was sitting out there listening to us pontificate to explain all the things we believed and thought. And as we began to discuss the issue of reproductive justice, pro-life versus pro-choice, I saw her lean forward. And we went on and on, and I won't tell you the details, Teenagers can say interesting things, profound things, worthwhile things. And she waited for my friends to leave, and she came up to me and said, listen to me. Listen to me. I was a nurse pre-Roe v. Wade. Listen to me. Listen to me. I need you to understand that there is a pain and suffering that you haven't seen. There are stories that you don't know. There is a reality that you aren't familiar with. And then in that space, in her gentle and loving way, she began to tell me about her call as a nurse and what she'd experienced as somebody who stood in emergency rooms and hospital rooms with other nurses. And after that conversation, she whispered again, Brandon Dale, listen to me. Just listen to me. And now I took that story with me in all its weight and carried it in to my junior high life and continued to listen to my grandmother in a myriad of ways throughout my life. Sometimes listening well, other times not so much. But I believe as we step into the story of Doubting Thomas, that's one of the stories that rings true. There are a myriad of issues in our time around race, gender, class, and a number of other things. And sometimes those stories will move into our space. Stories of migration and immigration. Stories of housing and food insecurity. Stories of pain and suffering. Stories of redemption in which lives are made new. And it is not our job to minimize the realities of those stories and experiences. But it is our call to listen to believe, to hear, and to act in a way that embraces the realities of those stories. That was the downfall of Doubting Thomas. It wasn't that he questioned some archaic religious belief. It was that he didn't have the, have the capacity that day to listen to the experiences of Mary, to listen to the realities of those disciples, and to take into account that God was moving in all of those spaces, creating a narrative of love, hope, and redemption. So family of God today, listen. Listen to the stories out there. 
listening to the stories of pain and suffering, of hope, of joy, and everything in between because there is something profound to hear in those stories that will cause us and maybe even call us into new ways of being loving, just, and compassionate in this world. Thanks be to God for those who are willing to share their stories. And thanks be to God to those who are willing to listen and to believe. Thanks be to God. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. Earlier this morning, we lifted up many joys and burdens as part of our congregational prayers. I'd like to add one right now. I'd like to add the family of Marilyn Boysen. Mrs. Boysen was Brandon's grandmother, who he spoke about earlier. She passed away on Friday after many months of nursing care and certainly a life well lived. Brandon's sister and his cousins have been providing a lot of her support during this difficult time. We lift them, Brandon, and all of their family up as they both mourn and celebrate their Nana's life. As we gather now to share communion, we do it as a fellowship of Christian believers at the invitation of Jesus. We as a congregation of the Christian Church as Disciples of Christ require no other criteria to join in. The table is open to all, whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary or through the live streaming service right now or any time during the week. In the same manner, just as Jesus used whatever food and beverage he happened to have at that first meal, <clears throat> we do the same as we gather to celebrate in his name as he instructed. I'd like you to ask to prepare yourself right now, however you want to represent it either in your own home with your own bread and communion beverage at hand or here in the sanctuary by pulling back the clear plastic cover on the bread wafer. As Jesus did at that first communion meal, we use the bread and the wine as symbols only, recognizing that the importance of the communion meal is the act itself, not the sanctity of whatever thing we're using for bread and wine. So in faith, take what you have and share it with all those who join together this morning, this afternoon, this evening, or wherever we are as we gather as the family of God. As we hear Jesus' word about the bread, we will take it and eat it. Then following the Lord's prayer about the cup and saying that prayer in unison, we will share that cup together. As Brandon mentioned earlier, Mother's Day is a tough Sunday to write a meditation about unless you want to avoid the topic altogether. And that's a little bit problematic because it's Mother's Day. To my mind, you have to mention it, but you also have to be sensitive to all the nuances that are involved in a parent-child relationship. Many that are good, and for some folks, there are sometimes those that are damaging and toxic. But I think you need to top, tackle the topic head on. Mother's Day becomes both a time for fond recollection and acknowledgement, and for reflection and maybe even healing. I don't think that most parents are deliberately evil or cru cruel, but I think some probably are. And part of the development of your, as a child, I think, was to, when you think about it, is to actually seek the love and attention of your parents. Part of the transition then to adolescence is realizing that those parents aren't perfect. Then moving on as you transition to adulthood is recognizing that your imperfect parents probably did the best job that they could. I tease my brother and sister that mom and dad were probably better parents with them because they practiced on me as the oldest child. 
My mom kind of acknowledged this one time as we were sitting around the kitchen table. She was talking and mentioned that in retrospect, she was so young, and those were her words, when she got married and started a family and felt that she knew very little about being a parent and had to learn it along the way. In another conversation, she was responding to someone's question about her and dad's goals for their young family. This happened apparently before my, brother's, my, or before my sister was born because she said all she wanted was for her boys to grow to be happy, good young men. And I thought about this yesterday as I spent more than two hours of my day taking California state required training in child protection requirements so that I could renew my registration as a volunteer with Scouts BSA. As a Scout volunteer, I've been vetted and certified for many years, but this was a new requirement and it's for all people in California whose volunteer work may involve interaction with young people and it augments my Scout BSA certification. I certainly wasn't looking forward to it and as I said, I'd put it off till absolutely the last minute. After about 20 minutes of that session, I realized that this material was really quite different than anything else that I'd received from any previous training. And it focused more on the care, nurturing, and welfare of children rather than safety and abuse. As I thought about it, the majority of this material was really about being a successful, effective, and loving parent. Although the material never mentioned parenting directly, only talking about those things that a child requires to thrive and develop as a compassionate, curious, interactive, and decent human being, and taught in the context that the absence of those things constitutes neglect by a parent. The big takeaway after all this training, love your child. And do this by being attentive, not indifferent, being supportive, not dismissive, being affirming, not critical, being nurturing and not diminishing, being forgiving and not punitive, being challenging but not accepting. This is accepting in the terms of accepting the reality of the life. It's a message of our communion table and it seems to be universal. And I thought about this. This all comes from the state of California, and I happened to read it the day before Mother's Day. What a great message for communion. Thank <clears throat> Thanks, Sam. And so we come to the table, as we do every week, to tell a story of welcome and of hospitality. And so as Sam explained, in a few moments I will break the bread we, and share the cup. We will then take the bread together. Todd will lead us in the Lord's Prayer, and then we will take the cup together. But whether you're here in person or virtually, whatever communion elements you may have, know that you are welcome here. And so on that night, Jesus was betrayed. He took bread, broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a similar way, he took a cup, and after giving thanks, poured it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, given for you and for all. Each time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. If you join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us take the cup. I don't know about all of you, but for some reason, when I get to the part where it says, do not let us fall into temptation, it feels like one of those, like, can you say that three times fast? And then the, I mess it up. And anyway, <laughs> it's always a personal, personal struggle. It's really hard. But anyway, that's my segue into our announcements section. So good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day. Um, this brings us to our announcements. Our weekly announcements start off with Wednesday, where we have our Wednesday night Bible study. 
Currently, the uh, subject is post-resurrection stories of Jesus, and you can join Brandon on there and a few others. On, it's still online. Is that that's correct, Brandon? Yeah. It's still online on Zoom. And the link and the time are all in the weekly messenger. And then on Thursday, we have a double header. We have, in the afternoons, we have homemade Thursdays where uh, pack, packing uh, homemade lunches that will be delivered out to the encampments in LA. And then at 8 p.m., we have our weekly reflection reflection uh, that Thursday night. We have a goes to our monthly um, activities. Every Actually, this past Saturday, the first Saturday of every month is BTAC, uh, Burbank Temporary Aid, where we pack lunches and deliver them to the Burbank Temporary Aid Center. Um, and finally, we have our LGBTQ plus community um, and a queer fellowship. And uh, Britt has an announcement about that and we'll be meeting. Thanks, Todd. We're going to be next meeting um, the last Sunday of this month, the 29th. Um, here at the church after coffee and conversation to continue some discussion around the importance of liberation theology as it pertains to those of us who identify as queer um, and looking at the Bible through that lens. Uh, and then we will have something more fun and exciting in June for Pride, but details on that forthcoming. Perfect. Thank you. And you can find this and uh, more information in our weekly messenger. And if you need to contact, connect with our weekly messenger, it's on our website. You can Find it and sign up for it, and you'll be emailed every week with all this information and more. But now the question that's all in your minds, that's burning in your ears, is how is all this happening? How is the, how is the hot dogs made? What is going on? How is this possible? How does the church keep running? Well, it's because of all of you and viewers like you. So all of your wonderful volunteering and help is always um, appreciated, but also any um, offering you can give that can help. It helps our staff continue working hard and working behind the scenes on bringing um, things such as our Mardi Gras party together. And so uh, a couple of ways you can help provide is our very futuristic way. We'll have a QR code. You can use your phone and scan on the screen if you're watching on Facebook Live, or we have a QR code outside. It's very fancy, very 2022, 22. yes, that's the word. <laughs> and anyway, uh, but then if you want to go more of like the classic route and go on the you know, the modern route, as we call it, go on the computer. You can go to FCCBurbank.org and click the Give Now button, and you can do it that way. You know, type it all in. Don't have to worry about that touch screen, the QR codes. But if you want to go classic, the retro giving style route, you can always do it in person right there at the offering plate. You can do good old snail mail or just drop it off at the office at your leisure. And with that, I'll give it over to Brandon. And I'm going to give it over to Deborah first to make an announcement about an environmental opportunity coming I'll up. Hand it over to Deborah. Thanks, Todd. Hello, everyone. May 15th at 1 o'clock, I'm going to um, be teaching a workshop online. And I hope everybody will come. I've been thinking a lot about how to include Green Chalice into our church vision, including uh, we usually have a lot of things um, working towards, you know, um, relieving food insecurity, housing insecurity. And so I was thinking about how to put Green Chalice in that, and I came up with a lot of ideas for that. Brandon and I were talking. We both were excited about it, even how to get through rebuilding this building and putting it all together. So I'm really hoping that everyone will tune in, come and, and see us. And we can impart this vision to you, and we can talk about how we can be involved in that. So remember, May 15th, 1 o'clock. And if you can email myself or Brandon and let us know, you know, by RSVPing, that would be great. I'd look forward to seeing you. Thanks for all those announcements. And so I guess it is back to me. Um, as Sam mentioned, this weekend I lost a dear family member. Um, plans are still pending. But know that the schedule of our weekly programming will be in flux for a week or two. Um, once my dates are set, that information will be sent out. And if you have a pastoral emergency or anything else you need to address, that contact information will be available as well. I also want you to know that I wrote my sermon long before, not long, but 
before I knew what happened to my grandmother. So thank you for holding this space this morning. Um, and also thank you for your prayers as our family gathers to remember her, her life and all that she meant to us. But as Todd said, there are a number of opportunities. And just stay tuned if you want to be plugged in. And there are a number of lay people who lead the groups. So just because I'm gone doesn't mean things are going to stop or opportunities won't be there. Two other announcements. One is we continue to have a food pantry. Give as you can. Take what you need outside here. If you have extra cans of food or extra food, just drop those in those the, that area. If you need food or in need of something right away, also use that box. Um, it's meant for the community in all kinds of ways. And a, and a special thank you for uh, Rosie and her family who have been working on the garden. Um, it is no longer a jungle to walk through, so if you want to utilize our garden space, give thanks for the, the work they've done. All right, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite you to stand as you are able and to turn it over to Britt and the incredible musicians we have. Thank you, Brandon. God, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all persons. Honor all creation. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of that Spirit be with each and every one of us. Let us go in peace. Amen. <laughs>